Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for answering. It's wonderful to see you all here today. Uh, my name is Patsy Lewis, and I'm the director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. This event is being held in collaboration with the Department of Literary Arts and is part of a wider series of events organized under the Mellon Foundation Sawyer Seminar, Rethinking the Dynamic Interplay of Migration, Race, and Ethnicity in the Caribbean and Latin America. And the Sawyer Seminar is co-hosted by the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice, and the Department of Africana Studies, Rights and Reason Theater. Over the past year and a half, it has featured events exploring intra-Latin American and Caribbean migration through multiple disciplinary lenses, perspective, sorry, and artistic lenses. These included academic conferences and seminars, standalone talks, performance, art events, films, and art exhibitions. And this evening's event presents a literary lens to reflect more centrally on the complex and multifaceted human experiences that lie at the heart of the migratory journey. And this is not our last event, so listen out for more from us. But today I'm so very thrilled that we have a distinguished group of authors, all of whom have roots in either the Caribbean or Latin America and whose work reflect on these experiences. Before we hear from them, I, I just want to just give some brief words of thanks, um, primarily to Professor Matthew Shinoda, Chair of Literary Arts, without whose prestige and reach, this event would not have happened. So he is solely responsible for getting this amazing group of people here this evening. Thank you so much, um, Matthew. I also have to thank um, Colin Channer, who is with Literary Arts and who is on sabbatical, I believe, but who was part of an initial conversation around such an event. I also wanted to thank my Mellon Sawyer Seminar co-hosts, co Anthony Bogues and Brian Meeks, and the people often working behind the scenes but not always visible, but whose, whose efforts have made this event popular. Possible, sorry. In particular, I would like to acknowledge Kate Goldman and Emily Rubelman from Clarks, Michelle and Dolfo, grants and, and financial specialists who was very important in helping us to manage the monies for this um, project. Greg Picard and the team at the Grand Offs, as well as media services staff for helping with the tech and recording. And that's not everybody, but I just really want to single these people out. We are particularly indebted to our distinguished panel of writers who have generously given their time to come to Providence on one of the coldest weekends um, <laughs> this year. We generally, it's been warmer than usual, but um, we turned on the cold just for you. <laughs> I call you, you New England um, welcome. And of course, we are very grateful to your audience for spending your treasured Friday evening with us. I don't do much on a Friday evening apart from going home and crashing, so I really appreciate you being here. Uh, just a bit about the structure of the event. Um, each author will read an excerpt from their work. Um, I will hand over to Professor Matthew Shinoda who would introduce them, and after they've read, he'll have a discussion with them, uh, a conversation, and hopefully open up to a few questions from the audience. And before I ask Professor Shinoda to continue, I would just mention um, a little bit about him from his very modest bio. He is the author of the poetry collection Somewhere Else, which won the American Book Award, Seasons of Lotus, Seasons of Bone, Tahir Sweet, and most recently, The Way of the Earth. Along with Kwame Dawes, he is editor of Bairdon's Odyssey, Poets Respond to the Art of Romare Bairdon. He is professor and chair of the Department of Literary Arts at Brown University, and is a founding editor of the African Poetry Book Series. 
So, for Matthew, I hand over to you. <laughs> thank you, Patsy. Thank you all for being here, and thank you especially to this incredible gathering of wordsmiths. We are very fortunate to have you all here with us. Um, really, I, I can't recall a moment where a group as esteemed as each one of you was gathered together at the same time in the same place. So we thank you for being here. I'm going to introduce each of them, as Patsy said, in the order that they'll read. Um, and then we're just going to let their words weave together and then chat a bit. So first up will be Angie Cruz, who's a novelist and editor. Her most recent novel is How Not to Drown in a Glass of Water. Her novel, Dominicana, was the inaugural book pick for Good Morning America Book Club and shortlisted for the Women's Prize, longlisted for the Andrew Carnegie Medals for Excellence in Fiction, the Aspen Words Literary Prize, a Rusa Notable Book, and the winner of the ALA, YALSA, Alex Award in Fiction. It was named Most Anticipated, Best Book in 2019 by Time, Newsweek, People, Oprah Magazine, The Washington Post, The New York Times, and Esquire. Cruz is the author of two other novels, Soledad and Let It Rain Coffee. She is the recipient of numerous fellowships and residencies, including the Lighthouse Fellowship, Siena Art Institute, and the CUNY Dominican Studies Institute Fellowship. She has published shorter works in the Paris Review, Virginia Quarterly Review, Callaloo, Gulf Coast, and other journals. She's the founder and editor-in-chief of the award-winning literary journal, Asterix, and is currently an associate professor at the University of Pittsburgh. She will be followed by Fred Degar, who is the author of six novels, eight books of poetry, and most recently, nonfiction, with the 2021 published book of <coughs> Year of the Plagues, a memoir of 2020. He received the Poetry Book Society Winter 2020 Choice for his most recent collection of poetry, Letters to America, and the What Bread First Novel Award for his novel, The Longest Memory. He is also the recipient of the Guyanese National Poetry Award and the Malcolm X Prize for Poetry. He was born in London of Guyanese parents, but lived in Guyana until his teens. When he returned to the UK, he is currently professor of English at UCLA. He will be followed by Francisco Goldman, who has published five novels and two books of nonfiction. His novel, Monkey Boy, published in 2021, was a Pulitzer Prize finalist and an American Book Award winner. His novel, Say Her Name, won the Prix Femina Etranger. He wrote the screenplay adaptation of Say Her Name, scheduled and scheduled to film in June of 2023. His journalism, essays, and reviews have appeared in The New Yorker, Harper's, The New York Review of Books, and many other publications. He's received a Kalman Center Fellowship, a Guggenheim, a Berlin Prize, a Harvard Lad Radcliffe Institute Fellowship, and in 2022 was a fellow at the Civital Ranier Foundation. He is at work on a new novel as well as a nonfiction work based on eight years of closely following the case of the 43 disappeared rural teachers, college students in Mexico. Francisco will be followed by Shara McCullum, who has published six books in the US and the UK, including her most recent, No Ruined Stone, winner of the 2022 Hurston Wright Legacy Award for Poetry. She has also received the 2018 Bocas Prize for Caribbean Poetry and the Martin Book Prize for her book, Mad Woman, an anthology of her poems translated into Spanish by Adalbert Salas Hernandez, La Historia es un Cuatro. Cuarto, sorry, was published in 2021 in Mexico. McCullum is Edwin Earl Sparks Professor of English at Penn State University. She is also on the faculty of the Pacific University Low Residency MFA program and served as the 21-22 Penn State Laureate. McCullum is from Jamaica, born to a Jamaican father and Venezuelan mother. Tiffany Anik, it's a lot of stuff. <laughs> Tiffany Anique is a novelist, poet, essayist, and short story writer. She's the author of the poetry collection Wife, which won the 2016 Bocas Prize in Caribbean Poetry, and the United Kingdom's 2016 Forward Felix Dennis Prize for a first collection. Tiffany is also the author of the novel Land of Love and Drowning, which won the 2014 Flattery Dunn and First Novel Award from the Center for Fiction, the Phyllis Wheatley Award for Pan-African Literature, and the American Academy of Arts and Letters Road 
Rosenthal Family Foundation Award and was listed by NPR as one of the best books of 2014. Land of Love and Drowning was also a finalist for the Orion Award in Environmental Literature and the Hurston Wright Legacy Award. She's the author of a collection of stories, How to Escape from a Leper Colony, which won her a listing as one of the National Book Foundation's five under 35. Her writing has won the Bocas Award for Caribbean Fiction, the Boston Review Prize in Fiction, the Rana Jaffe Foundation Writers Award, a Pushcart Prize, a Fulbright Scholarship, and an Academy of American Poets Prize. She's been listed by the Boston Globe as one of the 16 cultural figures to watch out for. And you better watch out. Yeah. Tiffany is from the Virgin Islands. She grew up in the hospital ground neighborhood in St. Thomas and lives now with her family in Atlanta, where she's an associate professor at Emory University. And finally, we'll have Javier Zamora, who is the author of Solita, Solito, which has just a few days ago been announced as the winner of the 2022 Los Angeles Times Christopher Urshwood Prize for autographical, uh, <coughs> sorry, for autograph biographical prose. Congratulations. Um, he's also a finalist. Yes. He's also a finalist for Pan America 2023 Literary Award for Solito and is a New York Times bestseller. His debut poetry collection, Unaccompanied, Unaccompanied is rooted in the indelible experiences of a nine-year-old boy navigating politics, racism, war, and the impact of a border crossing on his family. He's the recipient of the 2017 Narrative Prize, the 2016 Barnes & Noble Writers for Writers Award, and the 2020 Pushcart Prize. Zamora has been published in Granta, The Kenyan Review, American Poetry, The New Republic, The New York Times, and Poetry, among other publications. Javier is from El Salvador and presently lives in Tucson, Arizona. Please help me in welcoming all of these phenomenal human beings. Oh my God, what an incredible group of people. I feel incredibly privileged to be in your company. Thank you everyone here at Brown that organized this event. It's no small feat. Um, I'm just gonna go right into it because there's a lot of us and our bios were so long. <laughs> um, okay, I'm gonna read from my most recent book, How Not to Drown in a Glass of Water. My name is Cara Romero and I came to this country because my husband wanted to kill me. Don't look so shocked. You're the one who asked me to say something about myself. Before we begin, can you permit me to have a glass of water? I actually need this. Ah, <laughs> oh, yes, thank you. Why am I so nervous? I know, I know, we're just talking. I've never done something like this before. I didn't think I was going to have to look for a job at this point of my life. La profesora from La Escolita said that you'll help me. You're Dominicana, no? She said, if you know a lot about me, you can find me a job. Is that true? Hi, good, because I need a job. The factory closed in 2007, right before Christmas. Can you believe it? Almost two years, I don't work. In reality, El Obama has been very generous. After the factory closed, I received 53 checks. El Obama gave me 13 checks, then 20 more. Did he have a choice? No, there are no jobs. My factory left to Costa Rica. You know they're never coming back. And after these 12 weeks that I meet with you, I'll receive no more checks. Like my neighbor Lulu says, El Obama's good, but not God. I'm lucky because I'm 55 years old. Did I say 55? I'm 56, I stopped counting. If I don't, I'll be in a coffin sooner than I'm ready. The point is that I qualify for your senior workforce program. Me, a senior? I, I told Lulu, I'll be a senior for the checks, but not for the canas. What did you say? Yes, yes, of course. I want to find a job. That's why I'm here. Please write that down. Cara Romero wants to work. What is a person without an occupation? Since I could walk, Mama taught me how to take Papa's shirt, put it into a ball, and scrub the devil out of it with a bar of jabón de guava. If Angela, Rafa, and me didn't work, they hit us. If we worked wrong, they hit us. If we tripped, they yelled. 
If we look to them wrong, cocotazo. If we cry from the cocotazo, another cocotazo. Ay, don't look to me like that. Like you feel sorry for me. All that made me strong, you know? I had to be strong because what waited for me in this life? <sighs> Let me tell you this. Compared to my parents, my husband Ricardo was good to me. In the beginning, we were happy. But even the moon and the hun the even the moon and the honey go dark and rancid. And I tell you, if I stayed in Alto Mayol, I would be dead. Wait, one second. Yes, I'm okay. Maybe you've lived long enough to understand what I'm going to tell you. My husband Ricardo hadn't touched me since my son was born. Two years. That's una vida entera for a woman like me. I mean, look at me. You think I look good now. But imagine me, 38 years younger, with brilliant eyes and all my hair. But suddenly, you look in the mirror, and time bites off your face. All those years to not be caressed by somebody made me a dead person. And then Christian appeared. When somebody looks at you, pero really looks at you, and takes your hand and slides their finger up your lifeline, it is impossible not to fall. And I fell, even if my son was sleeping in the other room. It was the only time I thought, who will know? But men talk when they drink and the words travel. My husband lost his head. One night, he went to the house where Christian lived, carrying a machete the length of his arm. Christian lived down the road in the big house with the gun with the gates and the fancy cars that came and went. He was a quiet man with a reputation of being good. He never made trouble for nobody. Cristian was asleep, I'm sure. And just like that, Ricardo cut off his leg. One clean chop. My mother always said, don't mess with a butcher. And Ricardo could kill and skin a goat in five seconds. Believe me, When I heard the scream, I understood that I was in trouble. I got up and pulled Fernando out of the bed, packed whatever I could carry in a garbage bag, and ran. Thank God, Mama lived only one mile away. The night so dark, I couldn't see my hands in front of me. Better that way. I don't even want to think about what else was out in that dirt road. Have you been to El Monte in Dominican Republic? Have you? No? Well, imagine my son crying against my chest, me trying to shush him so not to wake the dogs, the snakes, the rats, the pigs, not a car in sight. How many women have disappeared this way walking on the road? But I had no time to be afraid of the night or what waited for me. Better the earth eat us both than me to return to Ricardo. Ese salvaje. He would kill me to end the humiliation he felt. Forget about the million of women he had fucked. But the one time I do it, The one time, I, I could feel all my skin, all my life exploding. I was afraid my mother was going to send me back to Ricardo. She had said it too many times. She couldn't feed one more mouth, forget about two. She later asked, why did you get under another man? Yes, I was lonely, but I knew then and I know now. I did it because I wanted to change my life. That's what we have to do. We step in the shit on purpose, so we're forced to buy new shoes. You know what I'm saying? Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Thank you, Matthew, for the invitation, and Professor Lewis. In this um, extract from this memoir, I'll just um, I try to imagine what it's like to be Emmett Till's mother. This is a photograph of my son, Emmett Till, my son. I have to keep saying it to believe it. Don't avert your eyes, keep looking at him. I want you to see him the way I must from this day to my last. Is that the face of a 14-year-old boy? Is that my son's face? 
I do not recognize him, or I should not, but I do. That's him. I was the one who sent him to the place where this was done to him. I sent him there for him to have the time of his life with my relatives. I thought if I gave him a break from the city, he would come back to me stronger and brighter and refreshed by his time in the country. But look what happened to him. Look what they did to my child. When he left me in Chicago for a summer holiday in the South, he was beautiful to look at, warm to touch, strong. His face had a shine to it, and his mouth and eyes smiled at you. I want you to keep looking at this photograph of the child I collected off that train, because your eyes, added to mine, will give me strength and help me to look a little longer, as I must do to serve my son's memory. I see traces of Emmett in there, there among the cuts and swelling. I can't help seeing his clean features, the face I told him to wash and dry, and the face I examined and touched many mornings before I sent him off to school. I see both pictures of him at the same time, this photo of him broken like this, and the many others of my healthy child that I have in my mind. I want you to look with me and see both pictures of him. The day he left, I waited with him on the platform for the long train. We stood close together and made small talk, mostly my do's and don'ts, which he was quick to reply to with a slight and growing trace of frustration, a tone I had to put a stop to regardless of the fact that he was about to leave me for a long spell. You must remember to be polite to my relatives. Yes, ma'am. Remember what you do, good, bad, or indifferent, will reflect back on you and on me. Yes, ma'am. Don't lose your one good belt. You need it to hold up your church suit. Yes, ma'am. I straightened his jacket one last time, though I did not know it, know it at the time. I hugged him and kissed him, and by the way he pulled away from me, I guess he must have thought his mother was holding him a little too tight and a little too long for comfort. I can hear him. After all, he wasn't a baby any longer. He was big. He was 14. I want to say to him, Emmett, you may be big, but I am your mother and you are my baby and shall remain so always. Of course, none of that exchange was possible in that little embrace and quick kiss. It seemed to last a long time now that I look back at it and as I stare at this photograph. Who would do this to a 14-year-old? You tell me. Look at this picture of my son with me and help me to understand something about the men who would do this to my son. I watched Emmett board the train with his suitcase full of the things that I pressed and packed for him for what was to be a summer of fun with my relatives. He left me in the city for the countryside of the South where time stands still for the body to throw off its cares and renew for a not about with the demands of the city. A child can play there, see more than concrete encasing trees. That was the idea. They said he whistled at a white woman who walked past him as he played cards with friends outside his shop. When does whistling become a crime that it can cost you your life? Is it only in America in August 1955? Emmett liked to whistle. Sure, he whistled around the house. He did his chores. I made him help me around the house so that he would grow up to be independent and make somebody proud, just as he made me proud. Who cares if he whistled as he worked? I didn't. But in the South, adults think it's a precocious child who rinses his teeth with the air and hides his idle, idle hands in his pockets while in the company of big people. I knew that from my time growing up there before I left for a better life in Chicago. I said so many things to him at the station that I may have missed the one important thing that could have saved his life. Don't whistle around or at white people. In fact, don't whistle, end of story. Yes, ma'am. Don't you yes, ma'am me unless you hear what I say to you. Yes, ma'am. His suitcase looked heavy but he said it wasn't. 
I made him pack too much. He had to have his best suit for church on Sundays, his good belt to hold up his long pants and several summer cotton short sleeve shirts and short pants and a toothbrush and comb and polish for his church shoes. I sewed buttons onto two shirts and straightened, strengthened others that seemed to be coming loose. I didn't want anybody saying that my son was not well turned out. I put things into the suitcase and he took things out and I put them back in again. To close the case, he had to sit on it while I secured the clasps. He said he wouldn't be able to open it without help or repack it on his own. As he carried it to the station, he worried that the lid might spring open and all his clothes burst out and scatter for all the public to see his private things. He complained about it and I said, if that happens, everybody will see what good care your mom takes of you. In the end, we did laugh about it. I worried about letting him go and imagined all sorts of trouble that a 14-year-old might get up to. This photograph is what they did to him. I need you to help me look at it. His face is swollen to twice its usual size. He is missing one eye and many of his teeth. His whole head is swelled up and covered in bruises. His skin looks stretched and underneath, just below his skin, it looks pooled with blood. I cannot help seeing those men hitting him again and again, grown men hitting a young teenager over and over again. They had to repeat this beating of my boy for a long time for him to look like this. I want to take, I want to take his place, have them beat me instead. Why didn't they just teach him a lesson? I wouldn't mind if they hit him, if they hit him for what he did, if he did anything. I would have given him a second beating for his rudeness. They could have used his belt and lashed him a few times around the legs and backside. They could have made him perform some community chore for breaking a code of the South. But not this. Many mothers have told me that I should be grieving. They've asked me, how can, you, can I show him to the world in this condition? I tell them that before I saw him, saw what they did to him, that I cried when I heard, and I bawled and pulled my hair, like any mother who have lost her son, but seeing him change, change me. How could they do this to my child? They must never be able to do it in secret without the world seeing what they do to children in the name of one race ruling over another. I thought for you, my son, who I keep locked in my heart, for you, I'll do this last thing and let the world know that I put my healthy child in a train and this is what came back to me. And that is a condition between the races in this country at this time, and that must change for all our sakes. Thank you. So intense. <laughs> Thank you. It's such an honor to be here. It was amazing readings we've had so far and to be with these people and thank you all for coming out in this really cold night though I hear it's going to get much worse tomorrow um, anyway, I'm going to read this little section of this book Monkey Boy that I've never read out loud before I have to be kind of an actor uh, I'm reading it because it's well, it's um, in this novel the narrator uh, Francisco Frankie Goldberg has been, uh, who usually lives outside the United States, usually lives in Mexico, Central America, has come home and he's been on a five day visit, uh, mainly to see his mother, who lives in a nursing home in Massachusetts, um, in the South Coast, close to the South Coast. And uh, um, she's Guatemalan, she's suffering from dementia a bit. Uh, the father was also an immigrant, but from the Russian, Russian Jewish dad, who's now, uh, uh, dead, um, and, this, and he knows that in, during the visit to his mother, uh, she has mentioned his sister, who's always been much less interested in Latin America, much more identified as an American girl, uh, even more identified as a Jewish girl. Um, uh, the mother is, you know, Guatemalan Catholic. Uh, she's mysteriously bought a house in New Bedford, Massachusetts. This is set around, she would have bought the house around 205, this is set on March 6, 207, which if you know New Bedford is a very 
ominous date because of what was going to happen there the next day. Um, he has no idea what she's doing in that house. Okay? No, he, she bought some old kind of Victorian old whaling captain's house. And the mother has said she thinks she, she married a policeman maybe, but she's not sure. Um, and has become an important person in New Bedford. Anyway, and he's carrying an arrowhead in his pocket that is an arrowhead that he stole from her when they were children. And somebody has given to him on this trip because she had been left in her with her for safekeeping. And he thinks he might surprise his sister and give it back to her. Um, <laughs> We'll see how this goes, because I, I, I have to act. Uh, <laughs> Hello, who do you wish to speak to, please? A child's voice, a girl's, I think. I ask for Lexi. I'm sorry, you have the wrong number. No one named Lexi lives here, she says, her voice that of a confident little girl, methodically struck piano scales in the background. So it's true, there are children. The policeman's children? And Lexi has a piano, too? Well, she's always been musical. Sorry, I mean Alexandra Goldberg. Doesn't she live there? Yandra, she says happily. Yandra, I repeat. Yes, sir, Alejandra, but everyone calls her Yandra. But I don't think she can come to the phone right now. She can't? This is Alejandra's brother, Francisco, Frank. You're her brother? Oh, yes, sir, just one moment, please. I hear her voice aimed away from the phone, shouting, Yandra, Yandra, your brother is on the phone. A moment later, she's saying bossily to someone else, Doogie, ve arriba, dile a Yandra que su hermano está en el teléfono. Another childish voice, whiny edge, answers, pero Yandra tiene cell, por qué no le marca ahí? She speaks into the phone. Why don't you try her cell phone, sir? Do you need the number? I tried that, I respond. There was no answer, but I can try again. Are you sure Lexi's home? Yandra, I mean? Yes, I saw her go up the stairs. Yandra has a show tonight with her band. Her band? Yes, sir. They have a show in a Kushnit. In a Kushnit? Yes, sir. It's a town near here. Please don't call me sir, okay? You can call me Frank. What's your name? Monica Tupil. That's a pretty name. Vos serote. Suba ver que está haciendo Riandra. I mean, Monica scolding again. I hear Monica scolding again. Pero ya. Creo que se está bañando into the phone. At school, kids call me Tulip. That's a nice nickname. There sure are worse ones. I guess it's okay. I think Yandra's in the shower. I'll ask her to call you back when she gets out if you want. Does she have your number? I'll wait. Do you mind? That way I won't miss her. Que puchica inútil. Ni siquiera lo dijiste de su hermano. Doug, no lo puedo creer. Monica, to me. Yandra's in the shower, but Doug forgot to tell her that you're waiting on the telephone. Doug has to shout that outside the door so she hears. Do you want me to tell Doug to go back upstairs and shout this time? Sure, if you don't mind, I say. Through the phone, I listened to Monica furiously un unleashing this new iteration. Okay, sir, I told him. That's your brother you were talking to? D Doug, is it? Oh, God, no, please, he's not my brother. What do I sound, retarded too? Yes, his name is Doug, but I, ca I call him Doug, but his real name is Smelly Retarded Horseshoe Crab. Retarded Horseshoe Crab? I laugh, and she does too. A mischievous, childish cackle. Who is this sharp, funny, bilingual girl? Tupil, a Maya surname. In the background, a stern adult female voice, this accent pronounced, interrupts, Monica, don't say retarded. We don't say that word. And Monica responds, I'm sorry, Maki, I won't say it anymore. That's Maki, says Monica into the phone. She just got back from work. I don't know if you can hear it over the phone, sir. But Doug is upstairs shouting outside the bathroom door that you're here. Yandra will come down soon. Okay, well, tell Doug thank you. How old are you, Monica? I've been 10 for almost one week. You know what my mother, what my birthday is? February 28th. My mother says I was born right before midnight. So if I came out a few minutes later, three out of every four years, I wouldn't have a birthday. Wow, I'm glad you got in there just under the wire. Happy birthday then, Monica. Thank you, sir. And Maki, she's your mother? No, Maki isn't anybody's mother. My mom is at her job. She works in a factory. Really? What kind of factory? They make vests for the soldiers in Iraq that bullets can't go through. You know what I mean? Bulletproof vests, sure. For U.S. soldiers in Iraq? Yes, sir, that's right. When you see the soldiers on TV wearing their bulletproof vests, my mom made them. Not just my mom, a lot of other people work there. Every, everyone else here works in the fish houses. Oh, sure, I say, the fish processing houses. What about your dad? Does he work in the fish houses too? My dad? I don't even know who he is. I mean, I've never met him. Presumably, he's somewhere in this country. 
but not here in New Bedford. Presumably? Yes, sir, presumably. He wouldn't go back to Guatemala unless he gets deported. That's what my mom says. You sound like you're pretty smart, Monica. Are you a good student? Always straight A's, sir. I like to study and read and do homework. Unlike some of the other retards around here I won't mention by name, she whispers, Tug, is somebody practicing piano there? Yes, sir, I play piano too, but that's Brigida. She's just starting. She's Doug's sister, but she's not as stupid as he is. Their mom works in a fish house too. And Deandra plays in a rock band? Oh, yes, that band, Monica says. They're not really a rock band. They're called Ahab's Hussies. It's drunk sailor music performed by crazy ladies. Sea shanties, you've heard of those? That kind of music. They won't be playing with Beyonce at Gillette Stadium anytime soon. But I guess they have some fans around here. I told Yandra if they want to make a music video, they better hire some dancers, though. Right now, their big move is when they all turn around and shake their butts at the audience. I don't think seeing that on a video will make a lot of people buy tickets for their shows. Monica laughs with glee. I hear a woman's voice explode in the background. Fucking Yandra, you can't even put the fire under the fucking frijoles. Not even that. Fuck you, madame. Fuck you. Uh-oh, here we go again, Monica says into the phone. Don't worry, this happens all the time around here. Oh, wow, and now here comes Yandra down the stairs. Madame? She means my sister, madame? In the background, la grande puta, always the same excuse. Oh, I have a show, I have a rehearsal, I have to go and see my mother. Oh, I have this. I don't give a fuck, senorita candil de la calle, oscuridad de la casa. It was your turn to make the cena, but madame can't even put the fire on under the frijoles. Maki, please, just a minute. I know, it's my brother, please. I hear my sister pleading. Now Lexi, loud in my ear. Frank, is this really you? What a surprise. But Maki, in the background, give the patojos dominoes again, eh, madame? When they're all fat diabeticos, don't blame me. Yes, it's me. Hi, Lexi. Sounds like Maki. So fuck you, madame. Frankie, let me call you back. Sure, Lexi, sounds like you have a situation. Maki, not going to your fucking dyke-ass show tonight either. Yes, the situation, says Lexi, sounding a little panicked. Frankie, I'm sorry, honestly, it's not so bad as I'm sure it sounds. I'll call you right back. Yandra? Fuck you, Madame Yandra? What was all that? It's like discovering a new civilization, not in the Amazon, but deep inside your own family. I stand waiting on Tremont, near Boylston, on the sidewalk at the edge of the common. A Dunkin' Donuts right across the street. The, duck is a, the dusk is a soft, rosy brown, a pink-tinged light that's making the hard scraps and patches of snow in the common glow like distant icebergs. Even though it's a Sunday evening, there are plenty of people out on the sidewalk and in the common, traffic moving slowly down Tremont. The phone rings in my hand. Hi, Lexi. Hi, Frank. I forgot to put the fire on under the frijoles. I guess you heard, says Lexi in a tone of affected, mortified culpability. Frijoles and rice is a staple around here, she says, just like in Guatemala. Do you remember how we always had frijoles at Abuelita's house? But it takes hours to cook. Good things we have tortillas, turkey hot dogs, and Kraft macaroni and cheese in the house. Okay, Lexi, sounds good, I say. So often this stingy brusqueness when I talk to my sister. Stop it, I tell myself. Be sweet to her. Tell her about the damn arrowhead. Okay, I'll stop there. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. I want to echo the thanks for Patsy, Matthew, for arranging this. Um, also, Kate, for all of your hard work. And um, everyone I get the privilege of reading with. And also, for you, for being here, you could be home watching Netflix in your pajamas. Um, how many of you know who Robert Burns is? Show of hands. OK. Should old acquaintance be forgot? Now do you know who Robert Burns is? Yeah. 18th century Scottish poet, songwriter, whose work outlives him. Um, I am carrying the surname McCallum. I'm from Jamaica, as Matthew mentioned. And all my life, um, and I'm a poet, these things are important to know because all my life people have met me and have asked me if I'm Scottish. Most of the time I've just answered and said, well, if I am not in the way you're imagining, um, it's a patrilineal name I carry. My father's father was a black Jamaican. So, and that usually suffices when you're shopping and you need to just check out at the grocery store. <laughs> um, 
But several years ago, I was in Scotland, and I was asked that question. And when I answered with my usual glib response, the person I spoke with said, well, you must know the story of Burns and Jamaica, the 18th century Scottish poet whose work I loved, I found out almost went to Jamaica to work on a slave plantation. Had he gone, he would have been an overseer. So out of that came a provocation in me and a question that actually most of my compatriots who are proper novelists would have been the right ones to answer. The question was what would have happened had he gone? And I wrote a book of poems, it's a novel in verse, that offers a speculative account of history that answers that question. Because I want to have conversation, I can't actually tell you about it and read all of the poems from the collection that would narrate that account. So instead, what I'm gonna do is just read a couple that are in my voice that bookend the collection. And um, I will just say that the book deals very forcibly with issues of colonialism, slavery, particularly miscegenation, and passing. So this is the first No Ruined Stone that opens the collection, the first and last are the title. And this is me, the poet, speaking to Robert Burns. You saturate the sight of those who come after Poets and painters alike, your words invade my mind's listening, manacle my tongue when I try to speak. On all, I backward cast my eye and fear and cannot see. Who would I have been to you? What stone? in the ruined house of the past. In this world, I am unloosed, belonging to no country, no tribe, no clan, not African, not Scotland. And you, voice that stalks my waking and dreaming, you, more myth than man cannot unmake history. So why am I here resurrecting you to speak when your silence gulfs centuries? Why do I find myself on your doorstep knocking when I know the dead will never answer. So that's the first poem, offering a kind of dare to me as the poet. I do resurrect the dead. They all speak in this. And um, at the end of the collection, one of the main speakers is Byrne's granddaughter. She is a black woman born into slavery at the turn of the 19th century and is passing for white and living in Scotland. So the book deals with multiple migrations. Um, one of those forms of migrations is the memory that we carry of our dead. And that's the way the book closes. So Isabella's question, and one of the questions she's pursuing in her narrative is whether she can bear to continue to pass. And when that is resolved, if you can call it a resolution, these are poems. I come back in and I speak at the end. This is a poem that is an elegy for my grandmother and for all of my ancestors. No ruined stone. When the dead return, they will come to you in dream. And in waking will be the bird knocking, knocking against glass, seeking a way in. Will masquerade as the wind, its voice made audible by the tongues of leaves, greedily lapping as the waves self-made fugue is a turning and returning. The dead will not then nor ever again desert you. Their unrest will be the coat cloaking you. The farther you journey from them, the more distance 
will maw in you. Time and place gulching when the dead return to demand accounting. Wanting and wanting and wanting everything you have to give. And nothing will quench or unhunger them as they take all you make as offering, then tell you to begin again. Thank you. Good evening. Oh boy, good evening. <laughs> My name is Tiffany Anique. It's such an honor to be here with all of you. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you for bringing your children. Um, it's wonderful to be to just be in front of an audience of so many different kinds of humans. Um, thank you to professors Matthew and, um, and to professors Lewis. And thank you to Kate for your help in making this all happen. Um, it's, I don't know if you guys could tell, but we are so excited to be amongst each other. Um, so for us, this feels like one of the dopest things. Like I have three kids at home and I'm a single mom, so I don't say yes to very many things, but when I realized who I was going to be amongst, I was like, fuck yes. <laughs> I will be there. Um, so I left my kids this morning, like, bye. <laughs> um, I'm going to be reading from Monster in the Middle, which is my newest book. Um, it is a collection of stories and also a novel in stories. And it is written in a form in which uh, people, parents and grandparents are telling their children and grandchildren the stories of their first loves. And the concept behind the book is that we come to know how to love and we come to decide who we choose to love based on the stories that we've been told by our families, by our culture. The idea that love is also a political act and something to be taken deeply seriously. The characters are coming from all over the United States, including parts of the US that we don't think of the US, like Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. Um, and this character is coming from the Virgin Islands, and he's experiencing um, what it means to immigrate into his own country. The question you must have is, what is at the middle of it all? I'll tell you, even though I shouldn't, doesn't matter. You'll still have to do the thing to know it. So what's there at the middle? Myth and magic both. No shame in that. We all know it takes a village to raise a child, but I can tell you honestly that it takes an ancestry to make a man or a woman. I would never have made it to my middle if it wasn't for my mother dying and for my daddy being already dead, because then I would never have signed myself up for a war we would surely lose a war everyone else was running from. My father had been fighting a war his whole life, a white man he was from the continent, a proper American, but not white, white, Cajun, he always insisted. Had fought in a war or two, seen nothing but combat, finally too shocked in the mind and broken in the body and so found himself stationed in the Virgin Islands, St. Thomas, but it wasn't sunny for him. Lived in our island, but lived like he was already dead. Absent without leave in no time. Made a half-breed baby who looked nothing like him, me. Then sat down on the bench outside a rum shop, praying aloud to die until he did. But even that, I am thankful for. Thank you, old monster. Thank you, dear suicidal poppy. I went to that American war to outwar him, but then my mother died, and it was so cold, and, well... That wasn't my true middle. No, we are the middle. This right here is the middle always. Oh, and I'm so thankful for that because though everyone was heading to Saigon to die, I was not, not me. It wasn't that I had connections, no Rockefeller father to save my backside, no joining the Air Force instead of the Army. We didn't even know about those ways out on the island. Army it was, my own no choice choice. The base cold as an ice chest, my lips frozen and my teeth knocking. No one could understand anything I said. I hadn't learned to talk Yankee yet, so I didn't have to say a thing. All I had to do was fake sick. 
And I've been living with the sickness for over a year, close to it. My mother told me she'd never breastfed me, baby formula just arriving on the island when I was born, and everyone thought it was better, best. So mommy scraped to provide it for a newborn me. What I'm trying to say is that even as a baby, I'd never seen my own mother as God created her. But then as a grown man, I had to face her breast, care for it that long, hot summer of love, the nipple sinking in, the huge red blister that took over until my mother dived into it, the blister and the breast. I was there taking care of sickness. I knew it well. Thank you, God. Black boy bile, the officers called it. In America, I was the black boy, despite my half-blood history coughing up spit, all fake, but I fooled them. Remember, sweet one? I'd bled so bad those first days. It wasn't that I was a coward. It was just that I realized I didn't want to war with the history of my old man. Not after all. I didn't want any more to hold up my life to his and see if mine was more worthy. Not after my mother died. I never knew the old man, my father. He didn't live long enough, and he was my first monster. And I knew he would follow me, has followed me, but with a dead mom, well, I decided I wasn't going to nom. I wasn't going to be the drink till I'm dead, poppy, this time with half mongoloid children, but still. His story is mine because I lived against him, and that made his life as much an influence as if I lived beside him. I didn't get that then, but now, now I just thank God. America, believe me. Even though they couldn't always catch what I was saying, I'd been a good talker back home. Talk to the doctor, talk to my aunt about what to do with my mother's things in the event. The army officers believed I was sickly, too sickly to shoot a gun good, too sickly to even look like a good target, so sickly. Me? My whole life up until then, I never even had the flu. I'd sprained my thumb once, but never a wrist or an ankle. Sick wasn't my thing until it was then faking it so well made it so real, and now that's how you know me, daughter. Your poorly papa, your hypochondriac dad. Well, the war. For me, there was no walking among tropical trees that might make me long for home, no blinding light just before the rat-a-tat of a screaming enemy, no warm sweat in my face and pits. My war stayed cold and quiet. I was put to ironing the uniforms of those who came back dead. I ironed alone and in air conditioning. I had to keep the clothes crisp, ready them for their formal funerals. Easy work on the body, hard on the mind, because it was Vietnam times. And so you know about the many who came back dead. And so you know about the many shirts I had to iron. And so you know about the many monsters that live with me. I never fought in that war. I ironed. And I did it well. Did it tender. So to that I say, Thank God for every color, for every sizzle of the metal when it kissed the starch. Thank you, God, for the dead that came home for me to dress them. Because, dear one, what happens to you is on me. My fault, my parents' fault, Vietnam's fault too, because when I saw you in that basket, you reached to me and it wasn't like you wanted to be picked up. No, ma'am, it was that you wanted me to embrace you. You wanted maybe to rub me on the back, just a baby, but already assuring me that I was going to be fine, fine, fine. So you know about need, known since you were a small thing, my fault for sure. But what I'm trying to say also is that you can choose against me, like I did my pop. It worked for me when I turned away from instinct. Go with your gut, my mother used to say, but sweet girl, the gut isn't always good. Depends on what you've been feeding it. Because regardless, this monster is still coming for you, is always coming for you. The undershirts hot from the dryer, yes, they came for me. And I was thankful for the heat in that cold, cold room. And that is my whole war story. No clearing of light and jungle of grenades, just a still life of stiff shirts. I was an artist in there of a sort. Pants with creases that could cut you, sweet girl, and being sickly now is just a small price that I pay. And I am 
thankful for my wife and for my boys and for you, the daughter who chose me, the one who cares for me best. I do thank God. I'm only sick now because I wasn't dead before. And let me tell you, there were many ways to die in that America of 1968. But for me now, it's going to be cancer, like my mother. What else would it be? Mine in the private prostate. The story of the monster on my back, the monster on your back is one of fathers and daughters, but also mothers and sons and mothers and daughters and even grandparents and aunties and first loves and seconds and third loves and who knows what else. It's all there meeting you in the middle, right where you are, where you always are. This is how the whole of history works, my sweet girl. And you and me and the whole of us, we aren't anything separate from history. When the government released me, there was the Servicemen's Readjustment Act, the GI Bill, they call it now. It was that or keep working heat in the cold. Pushing an iron was the only skill I'd learned in the Army. I did it expert, but it didn't serve me. Couldn't go back home to our island of St. Thomas just then. There was no home there anymore. Not yet, anyhow. So what did I do? I wandered. Years of that, small jobs, medium jobs. Malcolm had been killed, King too. By then, I was American enough for that to matter. It seemed like black manhood was dead. Guess that was the point. Took me a while, years, to get on a good path, but I knew I didn't want to be alone or lonely, so eventually I marched to Morehouse, where the Afro-American boys went like it was my duty. So yes, this is an American love story, because on that first day of school orientation, there was a speech for the Morehouse men and the Spellman women, the two schools tight together. The speaker said that thing I gather now, all the college presidents in America always say, white or black, that person sitting next to you might be your future husband or wife. And me, I was at the end of the row. I was older than most, and I'd been unsure about coming to the big meeting to begin with. By then, I was even a little ashamed of having been a soldier at all, death will do that to a man. So I'd snuck in late. On one side, there was no one next to me. And I stared at that empty space for a while to think about that. It had been so lonely ironing all those years. Nobody's to grieve over because they were dead. They were dead when they came to me. But thank God for that New Year's Day and for all the new years and new days. I am so Thankful for all of it, every bit, because there in that great hall with that man talking about looking to left and right, who was that man? I wish I could thank him. He spoke so well and so clear. And I turned from the emptiness on my right and there to my left, your mother. Looking at me like she'd been on a long journey just to get to that self-same spot. And when she said, good morning, I heard her accent, imagine a Virgin Islander, mm -hmm. and at her feet, a baby basket. And what year was it by then? 1993 must have been because in the basket, you. Sleeping, though I would come to know that sleeping wasn't so much a baby style. Me, I didn't yet know how your mother could curse me like cursing could kill how she could love like loving alone could make me live, how she could take a motherless man, me, and make a father and a husband. All I knew was that I hadn't heard those St. Thomas songs in so long, sounded like my own mother. And then you made a noise, like about to holler, and me and your mother together looked into that basket, and your eyes opened, looking at me like you already knew I'd be your daddy, your arms reaching out to me like you've been waiting, waiting for me to find my way to you. Thank you. How's everybody doing? Uh, it's an honor, like everybody said, but it truly is a fucking honor to be here. Um, I'm up brown. Y'all didn't let me in as an undergrad or, or as a master, but 
I like being brown at brown. That's why I wanted to come here. So um, I'll read from a section of the book, and I guess what you need to know is that the book is told from my nine-year-old perspective. I leave El Salvador, and it takes me nine weeks to make it to this country. My parents have paid for a coyote. The coyote leaves us, and us is important. The us is me, a nine-year-old kid, a 28-year-old man named Marcelo, a 19-year-old man named Chino, a 29, 30-year-old mom named Patricia with her 12-year-old daughter, Carla, and Chele, who must be, he's the oldest out of everybody, he's 35. And so we are the six. The coyote leaves us um, at the border of Guatemala, Mexico. We have to take a boat, a 20-hour boat ride to bypass Chiapas. We get to Oaxaca and we get on a bus and then the Mexican cops pull us, the six, out of the bus and they rob us. And now we're on the side of the road. Got it? So we're somewhere in Oaxaca on a dirt road. <clears throat> and by now we have another coyote. So it's not the original coyote. We've been walking since noon, 1 p.m., 2 p.m. We watch for police and soldiers coming down the road. Not the main highway we were on, a different route. Fewer cars, fewer towns, Coyote said. We've been on this road for hours, still asphalt, but there's dirt on both sides, cactuses, bushes, but no trees for shade. If police or soldiers approach, we run away from the road and hide in the brush. We scream, hide! If, if any vehicle comes from up front or from behind, Marcelo walks backward, looking everywhere. Then Chino takes Marcelo's job, then Chele. If it's not police or soldiers, Coyote holds his thumb out like in cartoons, says this is the safer thing to do, for him to put his thumb out and for us to run away and hide. Coyote asks if we talked while getting on the bus, if we talked in the terminal. No one says anything. He tells us to always, always have our pinches Mexican accents on. You know what? Just keep your fucking mouth shut. Now you're almost out of money, he explains. He's done this a thousand times, that it's our fault we're walking to let him be our mouth. He still hasn't told us his name, doesn't tell us much except that he's Mexican, but not from the shitty south of Mexico where we are. We've been walking for hours. No one has stopped. It's very hot in the sun, even hotter on the asphalt. Our shoes feel like they're melting. We took our nice clothes off. Patricia thought it was smart to put our wet clothes on, the ones we washed, she washed for me. It did cool us off for a bit, but now we're hot again. We're sweating like we sweated when we were sprawled on the dirt, the guns, their hands. The plan is to make a car stop to give us a ride. It has to work. Coyote says the boots took most of our money that he had to give it to them, that it's the reason we can't pay for another bus we must save. Coyote says Mr. Dolores messed up, that he royally fucked up, that the boots just want to scare people that don't really want to deport us. Too much paperwork. It's why you hide your money where no one will look. All they want is a little bite. Even I remember Don Dago, that's the original Coyote, telling us not to keep our money in our shoes, in our pockets, in our socks, or to double sock it and hide the money between the socks. Sipotillo, don't worry, Chele says to me as we're walking. He's sweating, breathing heavily. Sipotillo is what he's decided to call me. No one has ever called me that. We're from the only country in the world named after God. Think about it. I didn't know Chele was religious. Cabal, it's a good sign, Chino backs him up. So that means he will help us get to Los Estamos Unidos, Chele screams the last part. There aren't any cars, no people except us. No one tells him anything. Los Estamos Unidos. I like that. It's where we're going together to be with our families. 
I last spoke to my parents in Tikung Uman when Grandpa called them. None of us have called north. When Grandpa left, that's the last day I talked to anyone. Abuelita, Mali, Lupe, Mom, Dad. I miss all of them. Tú los estamos unidos. I want to scream it like Chele did, but I just follow everyone. We walk until our legs say, no more. And Coyote says, rest, someone will stop. We've been through enough for one day, Patricia adds. So we hide in the bushes next to the road as our Capitan Coyote holds his thumb out. All of us gather around Marcelo, who begins to explain what fuck means. Whenever a car slows down, but then keeps driving, Marcelo yells, fuck! No one knows the word. It's English, Marcelo says. Tells us what it's like living in Los Angeles, where he lived before he was sent back to El Salvador. That he didn't want to come back, but gringos caught him. I don't know what that means, but no one asks. Grandpa was right. People in town say Marcelo didn't come back because he wanted to. But up there, I learned some English. Everyone's eyes are glued to him speaking. Then he says, La USA is the best country, better than any we've been in. He leans closer to me. The best country, Chapito. It's my chance. So I ask him if what I've heard is true. Is there pizza during lunch at school? <laughs> Do kids eat hamburgers all the time? Are the streets clean and with McDonald's everywhere? Is the beach blue and wide like in Baywatch? He says, yes, 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 and yes. Everyone smiles. Okay, but tell us what fuck means. <laughs> Patricia says, it's a bad word. Say it, Patricia pushes him. The kids, he nods at us, then leans closer to her and whispers it. She blushes and her eyes get huge. Everyone laughs. Another car slows, but doesn't stop. Fuck, Marcelo says. Fuck, Patricia shouts, then Chino, then everyone in the six says the same thing. Fuck. We scream from the pits of our bellies, up our throats, out of our wide open mouths. We can't stop laughing. I still don't know what it means. First, I hope the cars would stop. Now, a part of me hopes they keep driving, so we keep yelling, fuck. <laughs> Let's give these folks another hand. Thank you all. So many things to say. Um, I, I want to begin with this idea of migration, which is, is part of the theme of this. Um, and, and maybe we'll start there and see where we go. Um, we, we often speak of migration as a kind of linear trajectory a movement of point A to point B. Um, but we know that it's far more complicated than that, certainly geographically, but absolutely psychologically, um, migration does not work in that way. Um, so I, I'm wondering if each of you can speak a bit about what this idea of migration means to you in your own lives, if you wish, but certainly in your work, how this, this movement operates for you. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. So we're always going to start like this? No, we don't have to do that. I mean, I can call on you all and do that, but let's not. No, no, jump in, please. Anyone. I mean, um, it's interesting to think of migration. I actually was born in New York City um, and raised in Washington Heights um, in a predominantly Dominican, Spanish-speaking neighborhood. And I like to say that um, we had one kitchen, two countries, mm -hmm. because um, I was, since I was two months old, I was sent back and forth. Um, back in the, you know, back in the day, it was very cheap to travel. It was cheaper than having daycare. So my mother would send me with whoever was going back and forth. Um, but it didn't matter which kitchen I was in. It was it my godmother's or grandmother's in DR or like in New York City. It was always like a similar cast of characters. Mm -hmm. 
even though we're in two different countries. So when I think of it, I think about how we're holding these multiverses. And I think when people talk about the multiverse as if it's some speculative idea, I'm like, actually, no. I think as immigrants, we live in the multiverse. Like these different verse ways of living are actually always, for me, always being held at the same time. Um, so when I saw everything everywhere all at once, I was like, oh, that's my reality, <laughs> right? So. I'll start there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. We can go in order. Let's go in order. Let's go in order. We're, so well, we're, <laughs> we're, we're so well behaved. Um, well, you know, from Javier's piece, there is a literal border. There is a nation that we have to battle against. But as a, as a writer, um, you know, I, I kind of invoke Bob Marley's idea of Exodus as an interior migration, an imaginative trip, not just literal but a necessary psychological um, bit of traveling as well. And also because of my mixed race thing, you know, lots of people have made me possible. Caribbean, very mixed up place, full of diversity and so on. So we know that migrations are um, both inner and, and, and outer, you know, literal and, and metaphysical. And as a writer, you're always on the move because if you sit still, cobwebs will grab you and you're done. <laughs> So I think of memory when you ask this question, and it's um, the thing I think that lets us cohere wherever we are. So I'm just building on what you've both already said, I suspect. Um, I don't particularly think very temporally as a person. So I think I also cross large swaths of time as well when I think of migration beyond the borders and nations. Um, because especially in this book, um, I hear the past in the present and vice versa. So, you know, I think that the migration of the spirit and the ways that when we move through different national identities, racial identities, geographical spaces and histories, the memory is what comes to mind to me as a thing that allows us to cohere. So. Um, thinking of my own family situation, it, you know, two immigrant sides of the family, 